radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. How's everybody doing today? It is Monday, kicking off a brand new week here on Fade to Black. Today is Monday, July 24th, 2023. Uh, did I say it? I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Did I get that out of the way? It is going to be an amazing show tonight. We ha- It's time to get our knowledge on. We have Mark Stavish with us. And I want everybody to help support our hard work that we do here, uh, myself and the team. Uh, we We broadcast live four days a week, Monday through Thursday. We do two shows. Oh, man, I do three shows on Wednesday. I do three shows on Thursday. And help support everything that we do. Get a Fade to Black t-shirt. The links are below. There's two ways to get them. Uh, You can just order a shirt off the website. You can do that. You can also get a Game Changer membership with uh, 2,000 episodes that are there in the archives. Everything is commercial-free. You get a, a a private email to me. You get all the benefits, full access to the website. You get all of that with the Game Changer membership. Um, all of the T-shirts are personally autographed and, you know, free shipping, and they ship the next day. So get a T-shirt. Get a T-shirt today. All right? The links are below. Tonight, we I, I have titled the show tonight, the watchers, but uh, it, that's a very small part of what we are going to be doing. We are going to be talking about ancient teachings tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, the roles that these ancient teachings uh, have in, in Western uh, mystery traditions. Mark Stavish, MA, is the founder and director of study uh, of studies of the Institute of Hermetic Studies. Established in 1998, he has published over 30 books in nine languages, including French, Estonian. You got to have Estonian, right? Polish, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. His links are below, and I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black. And he's right here. He's with us. Mark Stavish. Mark, good evening, young man. Oh, you need to unmute your mic. Oh, there you go. You did. Oh, you are good. Good evening, Mark. How you doing, man? Great. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And hang on for a quick second. Okay. Um, a little bit of weirdness happening in the audio. Let's, um, uh, uh, don't worry about a thing. I have it on this end. Uh, let's get the first time guest disclaimer out of the way, which is this, Mark. It's just you and I sitting on my couch, having a conversation as friends and where that conversation starts, it starts where it ends, it ends, but we end as friends. There you go. Except, except. Okay. (laughs) I love Uh, it. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. The where did um, uh, with your education and your background, when you go into uh, the mystery stuff like this, um, did that get exposed to you at a very young age? How did how did your interest in this start? Well, my uh, great uncle, who I grew up next door to, was deeply involved in all of the major esoteric movements of the early 20th century and on top of that he uh his father <coughs> was a uh, broker that is someone who was familiar with german folk magic and uh i simply was in that environment where you know of course he and his sisters uh you know had varying degrees of experience with this i have some of their early fortune telling decks i have one of my great aunts, uh, 
notebooks. We would call them a grimoire, but it's a notebook of prayers and, and, and magical activity. And uh, I, I even have here uh, his, uh, this is what you would call a, a true ritual dagger, you know? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I grew up in that environment of uh, that type of uh, ceremonial magic. But in addition, the philosophical views that went with it, Paracelsus, Bima, Kelpius, uh, those types of things. Did 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 that? Um, the, the, I feel like there are two kinds of people in this world, and and there's it, there's really not a the classic bell curve here. It's like one extreme or the other, right? It, it actually goes down in the middle. In that there are those that don't think about and and ponder the wonderment of it all. And and those that do, right? It, it's it's very very strange uh, to me that um, so many don't think about uh, other worlds or another life or consciousness or the significance of dreams or Bigfoot, right? <laughs> right? They're just closed down on everything, and then you have the other half of the world that. That wants to have these answers. Why do you think we have those two extremes? I think there's a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, until recently, life was cold, hard, very short and, and brutal. And survival in and of itself was very difficult. Right, Not that far from where I'm sitting is an old mine shaft anthracite mine shaft and there's a mining road you wouldn't know it unless someone pointed it out to you because it's been overgrown and the physical demands of life were such that contemplating these things in some ways made people even more angry at their lot because unlike a situation where you're dealing with karma, such as maybe in India, where people life was cold, hard, short, dirty, and brutal too, and, and still is for many, you had thousands of years of a philosophical view that at least allowed them to make some sense of it. We didn't have that. Everything came down to, well, it's God's will or it's, you know, the mysteries. And this caused many people to reject any kind of philosophical speculation at all, or they went philosophical and they speculated in a more material way, kind of a materialism, because this notion of deity and this incredibly, apparently, what would appear to be unjust universe uh, was just too much. So it really depends on where you are in time and place. And, and then once you start getting into the notion of these mysteries, uh, it can absorb you to such a way that you lose a lot of interest in day-to-day -day life. And the reality is, is if that, if too many people were involved on too deep a level, you know, society might cease to function. If, that's such a great point. It's, it's surprising that we got anywhere over the last 5,000 years in that, you had to worry about survival, surviving the night, right? Getting up in the morning, feeding, eating, and fending off fantastic beasts and everything else that you had to do. There was no philosopher. What's, what, what's Bob doing out there? Uh, he's contemplating consciousness right you, you know and and we, we you know we had uh these great moments in history when people were taking time away from survival and that's a really good way to put it into something else the invention of the wheel or the domestication of wheat or creating fire right instead of 
uh, doing other things. It's amazing that we got anywhere because of how rough it was uh, uh, before modern times. Well, and I think that's the key phrase, and I'm going to have to use that in the future, taking time away from survival. And if you look at the places where we had islands of learning, and I'm not going to say islands of learning in a sea of ignorance, that would be too much of an extreme, but islands of learning in which learning was cultivated, uh, this would have been the monastic situation. Now, typically in the ancient world, that would have been mostly centered around the temples, temple worship and, and temple activities with the priesthood. In the Middle Ages, it becomes the, uh, the monastery. Now, you see the same thing in Tibet. You know, the monastery becomes the locus of learning, but also life is hard. You had upwards to, I believe it was 20% of the population engaged in monastic activity, which meant really bureaucratic activity. The monastic structure in Tibet was a governmental entity. So not everybody there was practicing, nor was everybody there really practicing highest yoga tantras. And we really need to wrap our head around that. We have these kind of delusions about what it was like, the, you know, the, the fantasy of Shangri-La. And, and the same is true in, in Western and Eastern Europe, that many people went to the monasteries because at least it provided uh, food. And One, peace. <laughs> right. Relative peace. You, yes. you were at least guaranteed to eat better than if you were on the other side of the monastic uh, wall or gate and in within that monastic structure many of the monasteries were also landholders so the areas around it the serfs around it or the later uh, landed peasantry or gentry they had a certain degree of obligation and business interaction and social interaction with these monasteries so it was a very complex relationship and that's why we see within some of the monastic structures where we can look at some of them where people could take time away from survival to engage in the speculation of the mysteries and why we see some of the magical and the alchemical texts coming out of there. Can I ask you a, a, a question, a, a deep uh, historical, and you're not allowed to say, I don't know, is, is, is this, I, I've always felt um, that Alexandria, the the Library of Alexandria, of course, but and the history leading up to that, and the collection of uh, the Hermetic text and the alchemical text and and the knowledge, it, it, it's math, it's astronomy, it's physics, um, it's philosophy, uh, that it, it was accepted from around the world and and talked about and taught and and so forth when that went away so did the ability to teach and continue the traditions um and it's been a struggle ever since for the last two thousand years to pass down uh, the knowledge and teach am i wrong in a historical perspective or did it did it kind of s stop uh, at alexandria well, it didn't stop because you had extension, you know, satellite campuses, if you will. And, of course, the, uh, the Greeks were the great uh, example of that. The Greek philosophical systems were deeply involved in theurgia. You know, they weren't just kind of the dry philosophy, <clears throat> excuse me, we think of in terms of philosophical speculation. They were deeply esoteric, many of them. And if it wasn't for that, that continue that continuity into the Renaissance in the Eastern Empire of Rome, when that fell, when Constantinople fell, those intellectuals, those Greek scholars, which were scholars of theurgia, magical practices, esoteric practices, mm -hmm. very similar to 
the highest yoga tantras of Tibet and in, uh, in uh, India, they went to Italy, and therefore we have the birth of the Renaissance, as we think of it. But, but um, yes. so there was continuity, but it, it was a serious damage. I mean, it was serious harm. It, it, it I, I can't even begin to speculate how far back it's it, things were set. How much progress or potential time was lost? I couldn't even begin. Yeah, it. it was so massive. You, you, you couldn't. And the uh, and if we back up now, let's back up the clock uh, before zero year zero, um, you know, twenty three BC or so, uh, Cleopatra. But if we if we back up another fifteen hundred two thousand years before that. In that region, not only Egypt, but you had ancient Sumer, Mesopotamia included in this mix too, as well, where these uh, these ideas deeply rooted uh, not only in philosophy but Hermeticism and and the magical arts, but consciousness and love and everything. There, there was a thing that was happening there. And it was 1,600 years later, Greece was formed, right? This was 1,600 years before you know, Rome was still uh, mud huts at, at 400 B.C. And that's a, that's a crazy thought of how much progress was made and then what kind of setback that was. It it's, it's, was a tremendous loss for the world. Well, well, certainly, and, and of course, you know, when we when we speak of things like Greece, we don't mean the, the the state of Greece as we think of it today. There were the city states, and there was what we call Greek culture or classical Greek culture in, in various forms. And when we look at the empires of that region uh, of of the Middle East, uh, they were deeply rooted, of course, in an astrological view of things you know they're using astrology what we call astrology to uh understand their place in the cosmos and to attempt to get some sense of meaning we also see the indo-aryan of course it would be persia the indo-aryan uh religious text and philosophical texts so there's tremendous crossover back and forth on what would later be called the Silk Road. There's a tremendous yeah. amount of trade and a continuation of ideas. The, the question is, what was that cross-fertilization? How deep did it go? How widespread was it? Because we don't know many things simply because of the loss of time the destruction, such as the blatant destruction of Alexandria. We know that there were Buddhist communities in Alexandria. Uh, they were probably Theravadan, but they were still there. So these ideas were present. Um, and it would have gone back and forth as well. The first human images of the Buddha are from the uh, Greco-Indian period. So it was the Greek influence that created the first physical image of the Buddha rather than symbolic. Is that right? Yes. Are, are, are you just making stuff up? <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's true. Yes. I, I did not know that. The, um, uh, well, we tend to, the reason being is this stuff that we study has been studied in isolation for so long that really only in the last 30, 40 years, and 40 is a stretch, has it really been looked at academically. So really only in the last 20, and a lot of this is courtesy of the groundbreaking work of Antoine Fevre, okay, um, who really pushed this at the Sorbonne uh, in, in, in Paris, and then different schools grew off of not schools but programs of study grew off of that once it was accepted but of course there was a tremendous amount of trade-off to be accepted within the academy you know the the academia so now in the last 10 years in particular we've seen more 
uh, classes on esotericism and programs in esotericism, degrees in Western esotericism. So we're better able to integrate the different uh, programs of philosophy, anthropology, psychology, history in, in religious studies and comparative studies in a better context for it. Previously, this was just something people did in isolation, and that did meant academics as well. And you didn't bring it up because, well, you know, you were afraid of losing your job. That's right. That's right. Did it? Did it? Did it all um, come crashing down? If we look back, uh, just like Alexander in that library uh, being burned. Oh, by the way, I, I wanted to say this uh, a couple of times. I went uh, two nights over the weekend. I watched Cleopatra, right? Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton. I, I watched that four hours. And um, the historical parts about that, when you watch the film, pretty accurate. There, there's some, there's some things there. Uh, it's wonderfully shot, and yeah, it's it's commercialized and and watered down. But historically speaking, they really bring up uh, some interesting points in the movie. That being said, um, Isaac Newton is an example of. Uh, where we are not today, right? Isaac Newton, uh, biblical scholar, religious studies, physicist, scientist, mathematician, hermeticism, right? Uh, alchemist. Uh, he he accepted uh, all forms of knowledge and was interested in that. And that's right to your point. You can't be that person today in academia. No, and, and you, there's a lot of other things you can't be either. Um, one of the things which we're looking at when we discuss this is that just as we saw a purging of the writings of Freud regarding some of his interest in the paranormal, because that was unacceptable to his, his uh, later students and disciples, we also saw a purging of Newton's interest in alchemy. Now, of course, alchemy was the science of the day. We have to understand that. In fact, alchemy was taught at Harvard up until about 1830. So it was the science of the day. But it was an embarrassment when you're trying to take Newton and reframe him, recharacterize him as his father of modern physics. The same thing with Paracelsus. Paracelsus was really in many ways the father of much of modern medicine because of his experimental approach, but being an alchemist, he kind of gets dismissed. So it only comes up in highly specialized classes on the study of the history of science and medicine that these things come about. So when we have a popularization of esotericism and occultism like we've seen well since the french occult revival of about 1850 60 the birth of the golden dawn the birth of various martinist groups spiritualism the heyday of the counterculture movement and the human potential movement of the 70s and 80s the new age movement that continues moving to some degree forward what happens is the people who are willing to say something publicly may not always have something worth listening to. And that's a problem because they may not have all of the information to provide you with something that's worthwhile or viable, or they may just have part of a theory. And we see this repeated from about 1888 on within Western esotericism, where we hear the phrase, the Western esoteric tradition, <laughs> right. singular. There's no such thing. It, there's about 10 or 12 of them. There's various traditions. And, you know, we're trying to overcome those handicaps of over a century. And those handicaps of over a century come from having people bring the hammer down on you. I experienced it even in my own life in employment, getting called into a boss's office because of a class I was teaching outside of uh, work hours. And having to explain to him, you know, I think you need to understand uh, 
I'll have this conversation with you very politely, but what you're doing is against the law. Why, um, why, why does humanity have amnesia? Right? We, it, we make progress and then we just forget. <laughs> so, like, we forget everything. And, and, and we, it's, it's like a, it's like a deep rooted psychosis. We keep going through it over and over again. You said it yourself. You know, in the last 20 years, we're, you know, we're finally getting a grip on this. Well, it, 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 this, these waves of this have happened over and over again. I just don't get it how quickly we can f- forget our lessons learned. Because the lessons aren't a we. There's really no such thing as a we. <laughs> uh, this is one of the myths of the New Age movement and the the counter the human potential movement. One of the not only myth and outright lie. This idea of collective enlightenment or collective evolution. You know, evolution isn't a predetermined point. You know, they they like to grab onto Teilhard de Jardin, who was a Roman Catholic, and of course, being Catholic, he was and a Jesuit. He was brilliant fellow but he was dedicated to this notion that everything is heading towards omega everything's heading to this final point because within catholicism within the abrahamic faiths everything is linear it goes in one direction now earlier i mentioned astrology that's things are cyclic you know we call you know the, the, the cycle of return eternal return and evolution is the adaptation of an individual organism organism to its environment so that it can survive. Individual organisms adapt. Groups don't. And this is something that is ignored. And then you have that fabulous myth of, of the hundredth monkey, which I understand the theory behind it and I'm, I ha- I'll talk, you know, I'll agree with the general premise. The problem is it's taken too concretely. It's used as a concrete example. And that's for those who aren't familiar with it. And of course it turned out to be a fabrication that if 99 monkeys on an Island do something and then one monkey joins in the hundredth monkey then somehow monkeys on another island will begin doing the same thing. Okay. So there's some kind of interconnected consciousness that allows others to spontaneously learn at a distance what these others were doing. And again, within the framework of parapsychology, I understand some of the ideas being present, particularly when we deal with group activity. Uh, However, Again, the idea that somehow you're going to be spontaneously enlightened or free of having to do any work for your awakening because everyone else did it. And it what it is, is it's it's metaphysical welfare and in a bad way. I just happen to be at the right place at the right time. So, well, yeah. you know, the hundredth monkey idea, I've always felt um, uh, it's it's not so much uh, an entanglement or a consciousness sharing of, of things, which it could be, it could be DNA related. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just suddenly one generation to the next and it's just programmed in your DNA because uh, another example of the hundredth monkey uh, that came and went, by the way, was London and the milkman. So the milkman would deliver bottles of fresh milk, right, to the doorsteps uh, throughout London. And I don't know if they were finches or sparrows or whatever, but they figured out how to peel back the lid on the fresh milk bottle and, 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 and get a dose, right? <laughs> and the next thing you know, 
it spread throughout the cities of the United Kingdom. And, and, and it wasn't a, a, even over a generation. It was like a maddening thing. Then, then you had to have milk boxes, right? And it was like, and how does that happen? Well, that's an, observ- that's an observable phenomenon. Like one bird observes the other bird doing it. Right. Birds, birds are very smart. So observable phenomena is different than the hundredth monkey, which had the impl- which if I remember it correctly, and again, it's been a very long time, but I, I just came across it recently again. And I thought, oh, geez, this is still around. You know, <laughs> was, was that it happened at a distance. The learning was at a distance. So it was non-connected. It was not, it was uh, not within the no, genetic I understand. framework. I understand. And, and, yeah. and my point being that it went from city to city like in 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 a summer right it was like well, it was it was, well, a, it was a it was an epidemic well think how far birds travel yeah i mean yeah. we're busy doing our stuff but birds travel i mean uh, again not too far from where i'm sitting i have deer that roam through my backyard in a suburban area and they travel widely you know animals tra- there's a whole aspect of animal life that that we don't understand and with that uh, there are aspects of consciousness that we don't understand and that uh, some of that consciousness we're a part of and not because of some metaphysical idea, but just through the evolution of our physical structures over millions of years. What, when when it comes to that, I always I, I go back to ancient Egypt so much uh, when I discuss these ideas uh, because it seems that at, for maybe a thousand years, 1500 years or so, the Egyptians uh, had consciousness pretty dialed and, uh, and understood it and understood uh, the, uh, not only the ideas of other worlds and life after death, which is a crazy thing to think about, to have, uh, a part of a culture that is, you know, that this is 4,500 years ago. Uh, and to have this, uh, the, some of the papyrus almost 5,000 years old, right? It's a, uh, it's a crazy thing to think about. And then suddenly it just went away. The, the ideas and the, um, the study of consciousness in, in academia just just went away. You can't get a, a, a physicist today to discuss consciousness. They won't do it. Uh, they can't measure it. They can't see it. And they don't want to waste their time with it. It's, it's a fascinating thing to, to just think about. The Egyptologist, uh, and I believe he recently passed, it was a John Anthony West. Yeah, great friend. Yeah, I, I, on the show many times. I had the, uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of having dinner with him when he was in the area to give a presentation at a uh, fairly large Masonic lodge that a friend of mine was uh, the master of at the time. He was doing his term. And uh, he invited him to come in and speak. It was a spectacular presentation. And of course, beforehand, we're having dinner. And he pointed something out that has stuck with me ever since then. And it was that pharaonic Egypt comes into Egypt fully formed. Yep. We don't have a good arc of it developing. We have really primitive ancient Egypt. Then there's some stuff. And then there's boom, this fully formed pharaonic culture. One day to the next. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the high point. So the older back it is in that sense the high point and it kind of then slowly if we want to use the term degrades or devolves to you know to the greco-roman period so when we have the greco-egyptian papyrus the greco-egyptian magical text which are incredibly popular among many modern uh western magicians i point out to them you, you realize that's the that's like the new age folk magic equivalent yeah, that's exactly <laughs> of that period. You know, not, not what they had. And not to say that it isn't useful, but contextually, that was the stuff that survived from earlier. 
It's one of the uh, one of the points. Man, I missed John Anthony West when I would uh, have him on the show. Ah, man, I say this with kindness. I say this with kindness. Love that man. Um, I could hear the ice in his tumbler of vodka, and he'd sit there and swirl it. <laughs> you can hear it tinkling. <laughs> and uh, three hours later into the show, it was a whole different thing than when we started it. Um, but anyway. Well, well you so, know, next year, ask me on again. That may be me. <laughs> <laughs> I miss him so much. Um, but anyway, um, it is one of the things that – if we look at Darwinism or the missing link and, and we try to go into deep history and figure stuff out, that moment uh, in Egypt where uh, Orthodox academia uh, and especially the, the educated Egyptologists with a degree, right, will, will tell you that, uh, that the Great Pyramid and Giza – uh, was built at a certain time period. And that Mene, right, Narmer, the first pharaoh, the first king of Egypt who united Upper and Lower Egypt, that was at 3000 BC. All right. So the day before, right, the day before, we've got tri nomadic tribes, apparently. And then a couple of weeks later, they were building pyramids. And that doesn't that doesn't make s that the engineering the skill and it's it's everything else that goes along with it, Mark. Right? You have agriculture, organ. You have to have a government. You have to have community. Uh, you have to have laws. You have to have organization. You have to have engineering and 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 math and writing skills. And all of this just happened. That's the part that's confusing to me. I'm I'm not sure how to put these pieces together. Well, I think we have several questions that arise or problems to overcome. And one of them is the nature of Egyptology itself. It's a relatively young field of study. You know, only with the translation of the Rosetta Stone were we able to decipher these hieroglyphs. So reading them and understanding them and then understanding them contextually is an ongoing process. Within that framework, we have to try and grasp what was the engineering capacity at the time. And we're, we're trying to retrofit it or, or reverse engineer it. We're trying to reverse engineer all these things. So when a guy like John Anthony West comes along and says, you know what, uh, Let's look at this from a different perspective. Let's look at it ge geologically. And he had that fellow. Uh, was he from Robert Parker? Shock. Robert he, Shock. Yeah. Robert and he Shock. Looked, right. He looks at it and says, well, this is water erosion. And it would have been from this period of time because we we know that water was last here at this time. It, it is incredibly threatening because you, you have entire institutions for better or worse, uh, who are trying to manage their whole identities around being an Egyptologist and what that means and managing the national treasures of Egypt in an incredibly complex and political situation. Maintaining the dogma. I think it's dogma. It's like anything else too, though. It's if you go out on a limb too far, the limb breaks or you saw it off yourself. And I can understand why they're hesitant to say things. I get it. I think, however, the problem there is without being open to discussions like West was bringing, he was bringing a really good discussion to the table with really good information. Because you can have other people look at those facts and challenge them scientifically. I mean, is this water erosion? Isn't. When was the last time water was in that part of Egypt? Was it? This is pretty straightforward stuff. You can bring other professionals in who don't have a dog in the fight of Egyptology. Their interest is solely, you know, geology. 
And the problem of not addressing that is that then you open up the discussion by people who are going to bring in other ideas that may or may not be useful. And I say, I don't know. They may or may not. Now, for example, in all of these ancient cultures, there is the idea that the gods came and revealed information to humanity. And that helps humanity along. Well, what does that mean? You know, who are these gods? What are they? So suddenly you have an entire group of people saying, well, aliens from outer space built the pyramids. And they'll give you wonderful reasons as to why they believe that to be the case. Well, what will happen is those folks are going to get now very embedded in their own dogma. Aliens have to be from outer space because that's the only place they could be from. And the problems of traveling through space, we'll just ignore, or we can just make something up. Well, they can build the pyramids. They can create a force field. Or they can create a wormhole when that becomes a catchy phrase. So we go in that direction that isn't terribly useful. That's my direction, by the way. <laughs> well, but it gets what happens then is we we begin to ignore the physical realities of space travel. Right. So, so that, then, so then I, yeah, yeah. So then we get into the question of interdimensional beings. Well, maybe sure. they weren't from outer space, they're interdimensional beings. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. what does that mean? So now we go into a whole series of studies of uh both classical and we'll say continuous modern traditions on interactions with the invisible now we've entered into the paranormal in many respects and the magical dimensions which is fine because that's what egypt was all about <laughs> I mean, that's, but but it, that's, egyptology isn't all about that so right. now you have so how do you how do you get how do you get an egyptologist to begin to study and understand not only the paranormal, but the invisible from not only from the, from the perspective of classical Egypt. That's exactly my point. And, and you said it in an elegant way, but I'll go back to the point. We have amnesia, right? And, and Egypt is an excellent example of that. And John Anthony West uh, point that he made over and over again in, in his books and in his presentations, that there's this degradation, almost like you can't, it's, it's like a, a, a crazy form of entropy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and all the way to the point where, 3,000 years go by, Cleopatra, who is Greek, um, at, at, she is trying to keep, she's learning, right? She's Egyptian and, 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 and how to read and write and the religious traditions and everything. As soon as that was over, everybody forgot how to speak Egyptian. Everybody forgot how to read and write hieroglyphic hey there, there are hieroglyphs there was uh nothing left to the point where the pyramids are standing there in cairo and nobody knew what they were and that that's that's insane to me that's it just doesn't make any sense but it's that amnesia uh, and that degradation that uh, john anthony west uh, talks about and we don't even need to go that far back. We just need to look at the events of the last three or four years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, in all seriousness. Yes. Yes. We're, you're, this is the difficult part. And, and I really want your listeners to pay very close attention to what I'm about to say. We are one generation away from illiteracy. You're always one generation away from illiteracy. Um, so, uh, isn't that, yeah, yeah. Now, now, now let that sink in. Think about the implications of what I just said. You were, I, you know, in terms of remembering, I speak to neo-pagans, witches, Wiccans, 
uh, ceremonial magicians all the time. And I am amazed at how many people tell me they're a witch and they've never heard of Sybil Leak. What? I'm telling you. They, they've they never heard of even uh, Gavin and Yvonne Frost. They've never heard of... Uh, well, Ray Buckland, they usually have heard of, but I've even met people who haven't heard of Buckland. Okay, I've met people who never heard of Israel Regardi. And they're, again, within the framework of saying, I'm a magician, I study magic, I study, okay. Sure. They just don't know. I've met people who've never heard of, think of this. This is really, let this one sink in. They have no idea what the Rosicrucian Order Amwork in San Jose, California is. Now, this is important because if you're listening to me and you don't know who they are, from about 1915 to 1990, they were the single most important esoteric organization in the world. The in world. San, right here in San Jose, California. Right. Now, after their catastrophic collapse in the early 90s, they manage to recover somewhat and they still exist and they have grand lodges in, in various other countries. They are nowhere near what they once were in the eighties at their high point. But I want that to really sink in. This was the major movement so much. So it was the butt of jokes that you could join it by, you know, reading an ad in uh, popular mechanics. And now no idea it existed. So, you know, what do you, what do you say to that? You know, we, we're constantly needing to be rigorously attentive to the continuity of knowledge. How, how does the, how, how does, how does the knowledge continue? I mean, yeah. Okay. Universities and schools and, and things, but it, it's still uh, of, of, whatever it is that you want to focus your your learning on um th there's that aspect of it but um it's it's also what is being taught my my uh my daughters um specifically they're they're uh, 28 years old now right um i was shocked shocked to find out that they were not taught how to write in school, right? <laughs> I was like, wait a yep. minute. Yep. You, 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 they don't teach what? And I, I, I had, I had, I, I struggled with that. And, and when you say literally in a literal sense that we are a generation away from being illiterate, right? I, I just used that three times. That was pretty good. <laughs> um that that is where we are correct and we're, and we're on the cusp we're right there we're right on the edge yeah we're on the cusp and, and people who hear me say this particularly folks who don't have children and, and you know a lot of my good liberal friends don't have children and uh they don't pay attention to what goes on in academia or in education so they want to ignore these things to the point where it can't be ignored anymore you know and and to diverge a bit you know it's kind of like the opioid crisis in philadelphia or in san francisco okay you you can ignore that only to the point where you can't anymore and again you can ignore reality but reality won't ignore you you know it's going to come home at some point and when we're dealing with esotericism, which is my main concern, my principal area of focus, spirituality, we need to remember that we're ultimately concerned with reality. You know, my wife teaches at a private school and their motto is uh, the true, the good, the beautiful, taken from Greek philosophy. And they were asked to define uh, what is the, the, the true, the good, the beautiful. 
and you know, beauty Kardashians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beauty is kind of easy. I said it, it's a symmetrical right. harmony. Beauty is symmetrical harmony that inspires us to uh, something greater. The good is that which is beneficial to us that in, motivates us and others to something greater. You notice how I add it to something greater because, and I said, in truth is reality. Because if truth is not reality as it is, then those other two are just going to be subjective delusional states. If anyone ever looked at the artwork of uh, National Socialism or Communism, you could see that it was, by definition, very symmetrical and beautiful in some respects. Hitler had an amazing obsession with of architecture, you know. Uh, but at the same time, where is the the good? Well, the good was subjective, that which is I believe to be good for me or for us. So there was where is the truth? Where is the old the basis in reality? So until we're willing to come face to face with reality as it is. And that also means limits. What are our limits? What is possible or not possible in this physical domain? And even in, to some degrees, the, the spiritual domain to some degree. Uh, the, we always run the risk of delusion. And delusion will always lead to deformity. And deformity will be ugliness. And it will lead to that which is not good, which is bad, or ultimately evil. And evil would be that which is intentionally harmful. But we can't do any of that in, until we have a definitive discussion on consciousness and Correct. where it derives from. You know, well, we we may not have to. I, I think. I mean, is 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 consciousness in the physical? Is it a chemical creation, or does it exist outside of the physical? Well, therein lies the great question, too. And I think this is where we get into some of the stuff that people would rather avoid. Uh, they call it conspiracy theory. They call it uh, usually is the now the throwaway insult term. But, you know, they're not talking to the people, you know, two doors down from it. You know, they're not reading what is clearly stated in a lot of press articles and press releases. OK, so it's easier to ignore it. But you have a host of people. Uh, in that Bay Area, who are obsessed with some kind of immortality. And that immortality is of a very physical nature. And it's either going to be through some kind of biochemical means, or it's going to be through some kind of mechanical means. And it is going to be ultimately mechanically. All the technology is still mechanical, no matter how sophisticated the electronics are. So the belief being that they can transfer their consciousness into some kind of robot or upload it to the web or some kind of, uh, you know, ideas like this, then the question is, what is consciousness? And those discussions which are taking place there are interesting, but they are of a completely material nature. And they're they're fundamentally anti-initiatic. I would, I would say that they are of a, I want to be careful on the language I use because it has different implications, but let's just say it is regressive and anti-human. Well, he, he, okay. And, and the, the problem um, and you are right about that. Look, if I was the CEO of a multi-billion dollar uh, software uh, corporation based in Silicon Valley, you can bet I've got my engineering team working on immortality. <laughs> like that's, that's exactly the focus. And I think that the ideas behind it, um, whether you are dumping your memories into you know, a, a, a chip um, and, and some kind of brain computer interface uh, so you could survive uh, technically forever and become immortal, but that doesn't address the consciousness issue. 
Right. And and they are going under the idea that all consciousness exists in in every particle. There's a little piece of consciousness, and you amass enough particles together, and consciousness develops out of itself. Therefore, you know, that says to me that the Internet, right now, the Internet interlinked these server farms around the world and throw AI into the mix, then they're suggesting that uh, everything is sentient, you know, that everything has got uh, 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 some consciousness built into it, whether it's this Tesla lighter, right, your car, a rock, a computer chip, or your brain. And I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Consciousness isn't from the physical, but that's what Silicon Valley and those crazy thinkers are going on. Well, there are certain esoteric schools that will say consciousness is omnipresent. Um, the problem with that statement is that when people hear it, they don't really take the time to think about what that means. And we can think of that as a kind of habit pattern. And that habit pattern, we could say, is like a weak or strong force in physics. It's what causes something to sustain itself. So why is one rock different from another rock different from a tree? And we'll say because there's different levels of consciousness. But that level of consciousness is so minuscule that it does one thing. You know, it's not, it's not even a self, there's, the question is, is there self-awareness to it? So when we talk about consciousness, outside of the frame, with even within that framework of esotericism, we're dealing with the question of what is sentience or self-awareness. And that comes in varying degrees. Now, people argue that animals aren't self-aware. And I'll say, well... I don't believe that to be the case. I've spent enough time around them to where I believe they're very much self-aware. Just not the same as you. See, people have trouble then compressing their ideas to try and really fit into something which is because it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary to kind of because it's a, a constriction. Okay. So th what we tend to do is then project or anthrop anthropomorphize project human qualities on these things, rock. I mean, I had friends who did that with their crystals and stuff. It, was, it really was crazy, you know, and dogs or animals. They cut, you know, talk about their dogs like they're fur babies. I've got dogs. I love them. They're spectacular animals. They're not the same as children. Now they have maybe qualities like children, like a two or three or four year old child. Okay. But they're not your children. And th this is where a lot of the, uh, we allow a lot of the confusion to uh, to sink in. So the question being then is what is sentience? What is self-awareness? Now, you know, if you want something that'll really, you know, scare the listeners and keep them up at night, uh, we have this notion of what is the ghost in the machine, right? So if a human being with its complex biological structure now, remember, you said, you know, in a way, what you described does happen. You know, you get the right components together and consciousness arises. You get the right components together and consciousness has a vehicle to arise. You have schools of Indian thought of Ashtang Yoga, we call Raja Yoga or Ashtang Eatlum Yoga. You know, that, they'll tell you very clearly. What we're doing is we're getting the components of the mind in the right organized structure we're not doing something we're just creating the condition by getting things the right place and then insight or enlightenment arises when the parts are lined up or the aspects are lined up properly for lack of a better description now, there's, so, there's but let me just say this so now the ghost yeah. in the machine is can external entities or beings take over control of those complex machines as they get more and more complex on some level of, I don't want to call it sentience, but 
The, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And I, I'm a walking paradox. And let me tell you why. All right. I believe that consciousness is first, the chicken or the egg. Right. Mm -hmm. I think consciousness is first. It, it, it exists outside of the physical. But don't don't swear at your car. Don't don't kick your car tire in anger because it's not going to start when you're late for work the next morning. Right? It's conscious. So it's 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 a, it's a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a paradox of of myself in the way that I view things. Well, you look at it this way, you know, within the framework of Kabbalah and alchemy, consciousness is first, the same thing with these other systems I'm familiar with. And then consciousness manages to constrict itself. You know, that's what we're talking about. The, the, the ancient schools are very clear on this because if it didn't constrict itself, it could not limit itself. If it didn't limit itself, it could not multiply itself. If it didn't multiply itself. There could be no self-awareness. Because if there's only one thing and there's nothing else, then there's nothing to be self-aware of. So God is big, dumb, and stupid. So only in the act of restriction and multiplication does what we think of as self-awareness have a, a potential to take place through the, the friction and the engagement of all these different parts that become multiplied uh, over time. We call that the big bang, for, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in that in that process, you go from very, very subtle awareness to very, very dense awareness. And the different schools talk about this in terms of moving, you know, they talk about beings coming from different dimensions and different levels. And, and people often think of that as very concretely. Unfortunately, it needs to be more subtle than that. They come from different dimensions of subtlety into concreteness, or what we think of as concreteness, this material dimension. And then, of course, what's happening is that there's psychic or paranormal phenomena taking place with this, what we'll call psychokinesis, or the in impact of mind on matter, and a movement of energy and matter. So different environments are being created with this too, pulling things together and, and creating new vehicles and physical structures for their own uh, continued propagation of awareness. We're going to have, uh, speaking of awareness, uh, we're going to have a hearing in Congress this Wednesday on UFOs, right? This, this is pretty crazy. And not, and we're bringing witnesses forward uh, for sworn testimony on uh, government. Uh, uh, employees about their knowledge of direct contact with ET and UFOs and flying saucers in our possession. This is going to go down this Wednesday. Now, if ET, I, I, I cannot wait for this. This is like a serious Siskel and Ebert popcorn, Dr. Pepper kind of day for me. Um, it's going to be great. But when E.T. finally steps off that flying saucer and, and speaks to the world, is, is that from a spiritual take? Is, is E.T. spiritual if consciousness exists outside of the body and is therefore universal? And E.T. is smart enough to get here, much smarter than us. Are they a spiritual entity? Well, just as an aside, you know, Wednesday is an interesting day because, of course, it's ruled by Mercury, which is the uh, the god of uh, liars and thieves as well as uh, messengers of the gods. And uh, John Keel noted that uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays were the uh, two most uh, common days for uh, extraterrestrial or encounters. I, I think, you know, and again, when we look at the notion of testimony, uh, you know, if if we have this stuff, then it's time to bring it out and, and show us the artifacts. Uh, testimony is fine, but after a while, it just becomes another distraction, uh, keeping people from focusing on things that might actually help them. Because you can be obsessed with 
UFOs all you want, but it's not going to help you when you're dead. And when we talk about spiritual practice and the continuity of consciousness, that's what we're talking about. You're not just the here, but the hereafter as well. Well, that's 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 that was my question. Now, if these extraterrestrials are are, uh, and we'll call we're calling them ETs, well, they could be interdimensional beings. What is and and what does that mean by interdimensional? It means that there is a mechanism whereby they move through time space from one point to another. But it also suggests that they are there's they're not coming from somewhere. They're here on some level, just as the ancient gods were here on some level. And Jacques Vallée did a lot of research on this. And uh, what was his book? Was it Messengers? Uh, Messages yeah. of Deception is one of them. But was it Magnolia? Yeah, the other Magnolia. Magnolia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we have to say just because something is invisible and that becomes visible because it's interdimensional and then becomes tangible to us doesn't necessarily mean it has our best interest at heart, nor does it necessarily mean that it really is smarter than us. Um, you know, when we look at folklore, there's a, a laundry list of beings that uh, are engaged with or we have encounters with, which Valet researched in his book, that, that aren't necessarily uh, friendly towards us. Now, they could also just be more powerful, but not necessarily smarter. And that's the great problem with so much of this paranormal research. Uh, you see folks going out, and I mentioned this on my recent interview with uh, George Norris. I said, look, you have these folks going out there to insane asylums and the hospitals and the prisons and the battlefields, places of great trauma, and they want to talk to a ghost. Now, let me ask you, if you were going to a state penitentiary or an insane asylum, and you want to talk to the ghost of someone who isn't there, would you want to be around that person when they were alive? Probably not. So now why do you want to engage with them now that they're dead? You know, what makes you believe that somehow this is going to be beneficial to you? And it's because we have taken metaphysics or paranormal research and psychic phenomena and all these things, and we have separated them out from classical esoteric practices. So just as I mentioned, all those folks who, who don't know who, you know, uh, Dion Fortune was or Sybil Leak or any of these, or Israel Regardi, I'm constantly amazed at how many people I meet who are involved in paranormal research who have not a single iota of interest in what you would think of as classical esoteric studies. In fact, they're, they reject the idea that it's even something that they need to look at. Well, is it, is it, we need to take, you know what, we're 10 minutes past the break. Uh, let, let's get this in, Mark. This is a fascinating conversation. Stay right there. Our guest tonight, Mark Stavish. And, and I told everybody as we started this uh, show tonight, we are about to get our learn on. Tonight is knowledge night. I'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023 as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip with live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous Indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. Also introducing our Disclosure Fest VR Starship Area with dozens of rides. You've got to check it out. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit Disclosure Fest. 
Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to jimmychurchradio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. Hey everybody, it's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there for Bid and Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Mark Stavish. And the the Forbidden Conscious Awards this weekend in Miami, I'll be hosting. I cannot wait for this. Sold out. (sighs) Sold out. I cannot wait to walk out on that stage. I'll be doing some live streaming and and, and things from uh, Miami this weekend. Our guest tonight, Mark Savage. And talking about um, the, the mystery schools and... And I've uh, I, I've tried to chase one down. I've I've tried to, <laughs> I've tried to enroll. Can't seem to find a, a a good mystery school these days. Tough to come by. But why did uh, hermeticism and and alchemy start to get such a, a, a bad label? Um, and and today. It, 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 it's, it's, it's just, it's a strange thing to me, but it, it seems like it was forced on society. 
Well, well, of course, you know, you're always free to enroll in the, the Institute for Hermetic Studies. You're, you're more than welcome into to our school, uh, as are your listeners. Uh, I think that when you look at why did alchemy get a bad uh, rap, it's because when the, at the end of the Renaissance, when we're entering into the Age of Enlightenment, and we'll say that the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, the, uh, the idea of fact-based knowledge was critical for social cohesion. Okay? You, you have to understand that you still had memories of witch trials, uh, you, of course, and you would have the, the one of the last greatest witch trials, of course, would still happen later on in where? But New England was Salem. In which something known as spectoral evidence was allowed. And spectoral evidence was the idea that I saw a ghost. I saw a shade. I saw an apparition. And that was good. So when those involved in the, the early scientific exploration came together and said, particularly in England, with the Royal Society, it was the Royal Society, you know, spectoral evidence is out. We only want to deal with things that we can replicate. And that's understandable because if you can't replicate it, what are you going to do with it? That is the basis of the scientific method, is the ability to replicate something. That's all your listeners need to understand. So when they hear trust the science, you don't trust anything in science. Science, that, that, that's a religious statement. <laughs> it's a belief system. It's a, yeah, it's a do, that's a doctrine of faith. Yes, it is. It has but to be replicable. And and I understand observing and measuring and and repeating. The, but I think even, that we didn't experience the Thirty Years' War. But <laughs> Germany, Central Europe was set back two hundred years by the Thirty Years' War. The uh, the idea of something that simple, right? It, 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 to measure and to observe. And, and and to replicate that science itself is nothing. It never stops there. Science is nothing but a series of corrections. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's improvements and corrections. If you're a physicist today and, and you, you will be proven wrong later, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's just the way that, but yet... Um, it, that, just based on that right there, consciousness, and I keep going back to this with the sciences, um, a physicist will tell you that it, it, I can't measure consciousness, right? I can't see it. I can't observe it. Therefore, I'm not going to waste my time. But yet they can speak the words and they can think the thoughts. They know it exists. But because they can't measure, repeat, and and observe, it's 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 not science. It's, well, it's, it's, it's I think there's some complex issues at work. I mean, not all of them are like this. I mean, you have people now doing research on on the paranormal research off and on since the '60s. We have people who get funded for it now. But that's the point: is who's going to fund this? It, it's very concrete. Okay, we're going to do studies in consciousness uh, research. But who's going to fund it? What are the benefits to it? Uh, how, what are we going to do with it when we find out? And, of course, one of the things we have discovered is that nearly all of the consciousness studies research of the last, we'll say, 50 plus years has in some way simply been militarized. It's been weaponized. And I'm referring to most of the remote viewing experimentation that took place at SRI and elsewhere. 
So mm-hmm. I think when we when we look at this again, we're very good at you know in, in alchemy they say solve a coagula, separate and recombine, and we've done a very fine job within academia of and, and professionally as well. It's part of the development of the complex society we have of separating things out into very discrete categories. That's why you and I are here tonight, 3,000 miles away, communicating because someone was really good at electronics and other people were really good at it. And we're able to create these devices instead of being farmers. That's why we're really good at what we do because we're not farming. And a lot of this discrete compartmentalizing is now... you know, how do you then create dynamic interdisciplinary studies? And then how do you do it in a manner that is going to be really beneficial with that paranormal aspect? Because the problem is, is the doctrine of belief. Belief in the paranormal is foundational to being able to experience it. You know, whether you believe you're wrong or right, you're right. <laughs> yeah, so that, that whole that whole story, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. So it, then what happens is how do you get that in there? And it, it just, it goes back to the, the experiences of when religious institutions ran most of the institutions of higher learning and imposed a certain doctrine of belief. And in order to, get rid of that regimentation of doctrine of belief that was limiting fact-based research. Now the people involved in fact-based research, in theory, we'll call it that. It seems the last few years have called that into question too. Um, Don't want to be seen as naive believers. So the closest you'll come is they can embrace various aspects of yoga because that's acceptable. Right. And they can inv- they can embrace various aspects of Tibetan Buddhism because that's culturally acceptable. But to get them to engage in research on different aspects of alchemy or some aspects of ceremonial magic, well, good luck. Well, but yet, this is here's talk about a paradox or being hypocritical. Um, and in this case, both words apply to the same thing. But yet a physicist will tell you, you can change the properties of a particle by looking at it, right? (laughs) The the split experiment, they would tell you that. Uh, They they want to talk about interdimensionality. They want to talk about uh, 11 dimensions and the multiverse and parallel worlds and, and, and quantum mechanics and entanglement. But but ghosts, that's right out, right? The paranormal, that's a big umbrella. And all of the things that physicists today are, are, are trying to convince the world about, which is fine, are exactly the same properties of SRI, remote viewing, and probably uh, entanglement is, is central amongst all of this. So it may all be the same thing instead of separating it out. Well, let's consider this too. Just as the invisible beings came from somewhere to help give seed ideas to human beings and were thought of as gods, maybe beings of a alternate dimension with more insight, that is the ability to see cause and effect more clearly so they can see possible outcomes more clearly. Um, In India, they would call these the Rishis, the 13 Rishis that rule the cosmos. Maybe these unknown superiors of Martinism and Rosicrucianism. Maybe they have seen enough of the future 
and they're putting uh, bumper rails on humanity. Doesn't mean they hold everything in check, but it's like, you know, when you're not a very good bowler, right? And you, you go to bowl and they put bumper rails up so that you don't pop into the next lane. You know, Jean Dubuis, who is a French alchemist and the founder of the Fosters of Nature, that went on from 78 to 2000. You know, he said that uh, the uh, quatrains of Nostradamus were, were really not the work of a single man, but more of a school. And then you can see the suggestion of that in, in the, just the background information. And they weren't so much a prediction of the future as they were a uh, kind of ritual affirmation of the future, meaning putting boundaries on things, that things will not go past this point. And, you know, if we understand, of course, the quatrains are very difficult to understand. People have very diverse understandings or interpretations of them. But we have to think that if these spiritual beings exist beyond the realm of hungry ghosts and demons and dead people looking to satisfy some unfulfilled aspiration in life or, you know, your Aunt uh, uh, Jenny who just wants to talk to you or looking to come back. That if there are beings on higher dimensions that are truly are enlightened or in varying degrees of enlightenment, that insight, clarity, and, and, and with that, what the Greek theurgists would say would bring virtue or powers as well. Insight is a de facto power. We can have power on this earth, but no insight. There it's the opposite. Maybe they are, by guiding us, all they do is create a, a, a crib around us that keeps us from going off the cliff. So maybe, you know, Maybe they're keeping it in check. But why why can can the world handle that though? I mean, what what is crazier for the world to handle? Uh that uh interdimensionality is is real. Uh there is another life uh beyond this world or th uh, there we have had multiple ancient versions of civilizations uh, on planet Earth that go back uh, millions of years, and, and we are not the first. And, and that's why we have the knowledge that we have today, because it's been handed down and taught and taught and taught and taught for hundreds of thousands of years. What would be more difficult to handle? Well, it doesn't have to be one or the other. They, they do interrelate, but going back to your question earlier, how many people are involved in this stuff? How many people are concerned? Historically, it's always been a fairly low number. Again, go back to the, let's look at the opioid crisis in Philadelphia or San Francisco at the moment. Really? That's your context. And we're going to drop, hey, guess what? <laughs> we got these interdimensional beings coming here which may or may not what we call demons, which may or may not be angels. And really, if you read the de description of angels, they're not necessarily terribly nice all the time. Their notion of, you know, what is good for you is in the long term, not in the short term. That's one of the problems that happens is people want a guru or a teacher, and then they find out that the guru or the teacher is a dangerous friend. They're going to hold their nose to, to, you know, what's going on. So if you have thousands or tens of thousands of people who have basically committing suicide on the slow plan in one city alone, not to mention then let's go off of that. People just struggling to get by people who are gotten by and they don't want to think about this stuff. The topics that we're looking at have always been on the margins. Remember what I said, even about Tibet, 20% of the population was enrolled in the monastic situation, but they served as bureaucratic functionaries of the state. Very few of them were involved in what we think of as 
high-end practices. And in fact, if you read the, the uh, biographies or even the hagiographies of the people who, who achieved a great deal, most of them left institutionalization or the institutional structures to go practice as hermits, but only after they had extensive training, by the way. And the same true in, in, in Western esotericism too. You see people who may have had the advantages of certain good educations, but then they had to go off for whatever different reasons sometimes and, and practice alone or form a small group around them. And that took a considerable amount of time, talent, and treasure, by the way. That wasn't just didn't just happen on its own. You know, you still so, have to eat. You still have to eat. <laughs> that's right. You still got to eat. So how do you how do you take people and say, guess what? We have been visited by beings from a dimension. We don't really know where it is or where they come from. Uh, there may be many of them. They may or may not all be friendly or hostile to us. And they have capacities that exceed our technological knowledge at this time. Yeah, good that luck with that. that. That doesn't scare me. Well, that's you. But oh, the, well, I think, again, you are not the standard by which we do this. Your listeners are not the standard by which we do this. But I would, debate that. I, would, I would debate that, and I, I'll tell you why I would debate that. Um, again, going back to the hearings that are going on uh, in, in Congress this Wednesday, that to me is crazy town that we got to this point where our government and elected officials are discussing uh, UFOs in a public forum under sworn testimony. But they and, happened before, uh, historically. Uh, uh, 50 years ago once yeah but that's the point once. it happened but it but it happened no that was a debunking of it this is from uh, uh the the opposite side of the fence this is seeking answers the other one was to squash it um well, and we'll, we'll see we'll actually we know wednesday we'll, we'll know at the end of wednesday whether they were seeking answers or not i mean but, that's that's, but that's this, the framework we're given but this is this is my point, though, that uh, I want to make. You should see Tim Burchett's press conference he did a couple of days ago about uh, the hearings. And you'll see where, where he's coming from, and he's chairing uh, this hearing. Anyway. Oh, I did, my, I did catch part of that. Yes, I did. Um, he, he was yeah. not. He was, but but this he was, is my, he was gnarly, if I remember correctly, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very gnarly. But oh. this is my point. Is that I think that the world, um, uh, the, a, a general side of everybody now understands the size of the universe. We now know know today as fact that every single star has at least one planet. Every single star. So just 25, 20 years ago, you brought up that number. That was a great number to bring up. 25 years ago, we hadn't found an exoplanet yet. 25 years ago. And and so uh, 25 years ago, you went out in your backyard and you looked up in the sky, Mark, and thought, I wonder if there's any planet. Now we know that we walk out in our backyard at night and look up to the heavens and every single star, you can see 5,000 stars on a clear night, right in front of everyone has at least one planet. And we understand that today. So the, the question of, of life being out there and, and, and how varied it may be, interdimensional energy beings, meat sacks just like us, faster than light travel. Maybe some are just driving around in pirate ships. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it's an infinite amount of varying degrees of life. And it's it's that I think we understand today. I, uh, I, I think there's a theoretical understanding, but on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that getting back to my point, on a day-to-day -day basis, the realities are very different. Most people don't think about this for a variety of reasons. And when we look at the impact of ideas, I mean, the United States on book 
which means probably twice this when you look at off the books, is spending three or one and a half billion dollars a month on the war in the Ukraine. One and a half billion a month. Okay. We're borrowing money from China to find to help finance what is going on. Now, that's a ton of cash, and that's going to have serious implications. But when you look at then other areas of the world outside of the comfort zone of where we're at, just the other day, I was down in the remains of coal country in Pennsylvania, and I say the remains. There are, there are towns down there that for 50 years have gone only in one direction, and that's down. And the amount of geographic scarring from industrial activity that ended 50 years ago, but goes back another 70 maybe, is staggering. The opioid ep epidemic, the level of poverty, is stunning and it's ignored it's ignored in a lot of ways and for a lot of reasons uh but at the same time it's not just there it's in many locations across the united states and other parts of the world so bringing the idea to these folks for the most part that you know there's interdimensional beings or again aliens they don't have they barely have a framework that allows them to survive day to day in this world as it is right now. That's right. So when you add this level of complexity to it, uh, you never sure how people are going to respond to it. No, you don't. You don't. And 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 there, I I often wonder. Um, it, it, somebody. Of, of of which uh, you know, uh, millions do this every single day I, I, in a garbage dump, digging through smoking s debris that is piled up, that is uh, breaking down and catching on fire for f for food and waste to survive. Right? Somebody just going through a garbage dump. In India, in Brazil, pick a country, right? And and I'm going to go up to them and go, hey, man, you ever think about aliens? No. <laughs> you ever think about consciousness? No. What, what are you talking about? I need to eat, right? They, they are not pondering life after death. They're not thinking about the significance of of these things and a UFO hearing in Congress. I totally get it. I totally get it. And 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 why we choose to ignore it when we can fix it like that? I I, I don't know. Why does somebody like Elon Musk throw away forty four billion dollars on a software company when uh, the people of the world could be fed for decades uh, with that with that money? I I, I don't know. You know, then you're right, though, the bumpers, the bumper guards, right? The blinders. Yeah. Yeah. They're on so many people. Keep us in our lane. And and therein lies the question of, you know, what is the nature of existence? And if the existence is to self-actualize uh, and self-actualization, we'll call to become aware, enlightened, what enlightened of, of self-awareness and reality as it is then that only happens by overcoming our own inherent uh ignorance and of course within the tantras they say it's uh ignorance inertia or they say sleep ignorance sleep and death and we have to overcome those three so how do you overcome ignorance how do you overcome sleep how do you overcome death and that's an incredibly disciplined practice of introspection and openness uh, across the day, progressively, progressively across the day. And that's why, while I find, you know, these topics of interest, 
I always ask people to go back to the question of, okay, now these are wonderful topics and they help us expand our, our potential vision and understanding or vision really, not so much understanding, but vision of the universe of what value will this be to me in this life? And then of what value will this be to me when I'm dead? What does this do for me in the here? What does this do for me in the hereafter? And, you know, that's the notion of practical esotericism, practical hermeticism. It's concerned about practices that bring us or allow us to open up to the nature of reality itself beyond the notion of speculation. And it's considered uh, self-guarded. You know, it's a secret because you can't really share it much with others. But is that our next phase of evolution? I mean, is it, and wouldn't E.T., if, if E.T., as some extraterrestrial intelligence that can arrive on this planet, and I believe that they have, and I've seen what I've seen, so that there's, there's no arguing uh, for me on this point, uh, not with you, I'm saying in general, that's, sure. that's where I'm at, um, is they would have had to have gone through the same evolutionary processes that we are now. We have to survive. We have to survive, right? It, we have to, we somehow have to get through this. So is this our next evolutionary phase where we do move on? You said it's individuals uh, earlier, and I, I, I like that point of view, but we have to do it as earthlings, not as individuals. Well, you're an individual earthling and then you interact with other individual earthlings. Right. And some of that, in, some of that interaction, you know, is, is helpful to you. Some of it not so helpful. You know, just to give you an example, I mean, within the, the framework of even, it's not spoken of much, but even within the framework of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, you know, they have a, an idea of this world, earth. In this earth world that we're on um, was originally inhabited by beings from another world. And those beings from the other world had destroyed it. They destroyed their own world. And, of course, we hear the war in the heavens in different scriptures. And, you know, those wars in the heavens are also related to the notion of egregores collective entities so within tibetan buddhism one of the schools of thought says that the beings that were able to escape that planet as it was self-destructing some of them came here and, and the first one that arrived the first being that arrived sets up shop and because he's the first being you know he's slightly more powerful we'll say and gets to be the god and then the rest of them come, and they get to be gods. And that these beings, of course, as they come, their, their structures are what we would call astral structures. And they densify as they come into the atmosphere of the physical dimension, the physical world. So there's little or, little or no notion of a technology involved in that it's a process of densification of solidification it's just one idea you know just throw it out there to, for consideration if you if you take if you take the bible and it's not just the Bible. <laughs> let's just let's go with just about any religion. Uh, just about, not not all. But if you take things literally, everything comes from the stars. Yes. God exists in the stars. The knowledge comes from the stars. Everything comes from the heavens. There's another. It 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 is presented that way back to us as a religion and a God, but can you interchange 
uh, ET and aliens with that? And does that better, is it like Occam's razor? Is, is that simple explanation that it is just ET? But that was the way, the only way we could understand it and comprehend it 5,000 years ago. Well, again, the difference is, are we talking about physical mechanical transport on some level? Or are we talking about the movement of consciousness in and of itself? Couldn't it be and, both? Well, in, in some ways, you would need a certain level of consciousness to transport physically. But again, the, your, the limitation of physical structure is still there. How do you overcome it? If you need the, the original beings, as I described to you in that story, uh, did not need a physical structure to protect them as they transport through space. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a consciousness movement, just as you would refer to astral projection. Right. You don't, you don't have a, you don't create, although you might want to, but you don't create a car or an automobile or a tank and then travel through the astral dimensions. It's your consciousness which moves through these various, and astral, of course, means star, these starry dimensions, which, of course, are related to the energetic frequencies of the planets, the classical planets. And then there's some question about what goes beyond the classical planets when we move to beyond Saturn to uh, Pluto, uh, Neptune, and Uranus, that, uh, and beyond that. Those are considered dead planets, uh, which again suggests that they were alive at one point and uh, no longer are. So whatever the, the psychic dimensions of those planets are might not necessarily be uh, friendly to us. Well, let me go. Um, uh, I want to go back to my question. Uh, we 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 went left when we should have gone right. Which is, is this our next stage of evolution, though? Where uh, yeah. you know we'll look back, you know, in in five thousand years, three thousand years, and look back to this time as being a turning point in history uh, for us. Well, I, I can't really say for certain. Because, uh, again, I'm saying that individuals evolve. And, and you may have people who are capable of stepping up to the situation. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I'll just give an example. You know, if you're on a boat and the boat is sinking, you know, some people are aware that the boat is sinking and they go find a, a life raft and a life jacket. And maybe they're able to get some other people into the boat. Some people may not care. They may wait for other people to do that for them or what have you. They may not be able to organize themselves to survive. So we may have a situation where, sure, some people are able to adapt to this new situation, but a whole lot may not be able to adapt to this whole situation. Yeah, And, and then what happens to them? Um so when we talk about evolution, remember, species disappear in that process, too. Yes, they do. So you're talking about large groups of people not adapting, at least not immediately. <laughs> well, I brought up entropy earlier. And before we get into, you know, the second laws of physics and and, and, and all of that, mm -hmm. but there there are several different versions of entropy. All right, but but in, in in its basic form, forget about thermodynamics and, and all of that. Its basic form, you start off with something simple and it ends bad. Everything is that way. You move into a house, it's empty. There's no furniture. Look at your kid's bedroom in two years. There's an example of entropy. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and if we look at the, the complexities of, of the internet and, and how things started off in 1970 and where we are today, where everything in the world is now connected, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's our electrical systems, if it's banking, the mortgage industry, entertainment, 
everything now is connected to the internet. We didn't have that before. And it's software laid on software and software all the way to just, there is no governing body of, of any of this. It's all a bunch of band-aids. And if it comes unglued, there's your example of entropy, right? And, and the, the garbage dumps that I was talking about earlier, there was no garbage there at one point. Now it's piled up and you can see it from space. That's entropy, right? And it is, is we have to overcome that to do what we need to do in the future. And I'm, I'm not so sure that we are able to outrun entropy. Well, the, the notion, of course, is what is the purpose of life? How does this all come to exist? And as long as we're dealing with duality, you're always going to deal with some level of, for lack of a better term, entropy. You're going to deal with opposition. You're going to deal with dissolution. Because duality is a cyclic change. It's not static. It's not fixed. So whether we outrun entropy is less of a concern to me than is do i outrun entropy <laughs> okay so and this goes back to this is the, what is the purpose of esotericism what is the purpose of hermeticism the purpose of it is to provide people with practices same as in the tantras to have a means of creating a consciousness that will be stable in the hereafter and in ultimately in the void of beingness from which everything came. That's how you uh, overcome entropy. So if we're undertaking practices and they're not providing us with the, the capacity to stabilize consciousness, then we're not going to be able to survive. I mean, there'll be something which survives, but fundamentally we're not going to survive as we understand it, that is, have continuity of awareness. Survival is defined as continuity of awareness in the here or the hereafter. So when you talk about the, you know, the ancient Egyptians and their, their complex notions of the hereafter, if you pay close attention to it, it was about being in an environment that was identical to the one they had on Earth. Because they believe that Egypt was a direct mirror or reflection of the cosmic order. So their practices were designed to maintain a continuity of awareness on some level. And if so, of course, some of that involved worship. That is the mummification of the corpse and the, the, the various offerings and memories. As long as I am remembered, I exist which then has some aspect to do with what we talked about in terms of what are these collective entities or egregores, uh, so these psychic social structures composed of both physical and then intangible, invisible beings. And, and how do we interact with them? How do we even use those for continuity of consciousness? Continuity of awareness. That's kind of a life raft, if you will, situation for people. Now, if you don't know how to swim or you're not equipped, you know, maybe you can find a way to hop on a lifeboat and that lifeboat will call, you know, the, the egregore, like, which of course the various churches have, have done a very fine job of creating for better or worse. And some of them is for better. Yeah. That's why I think uh, we're at it. We're at a turning point. And we can look back at, at these different historical moments and go, ah, well, there was a change. Uh, here's another. And, here's... and I think we are there right now. And I think it's coming together uh, from a bunch of different directions. And it, it, there's going to be, it's not two trains, you know, uh, head on collision on the same track. I think it's a, a multiple trains and multiple directions that are all coming together at the same time. And I think that we will look back uh, historically and go, that's, that was, that was a moment right there. That's when things changed. Um, and I, th I think that's where we are. You know, I think it's science. It's, it's the conscious community. 
It's uh, the mystery schools. It's uh, the paranormal. Certainly contact uh, and our place in the universe. All of this is happening at the same time. And we're all talking. This is uh, we're at the end of the show. We're all talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really weird. We're, we're talking about the very same thing. One domino falls, it all goes. It, it all falls, and 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 we are enlightened, and we move forward. But I think that's where we are. Well, and, and the thing to always remember is, you know, you're going to become like the five people you spend the most of your time with. So when, when you pick good friends to be around and good friends, information to absorb into yourself to digest that moves you forward and to some degree there is again a a contagious effect to that i don't think it's as strikingly dramatic as the hundredth monkey would like us to suggest but ideas are contagious and we we can to, to some degree uh be a a force if you will uh, for momentum in a particular direction of, well, really being an example. These ideas have been helpful to me. My life is better because of it. People see that and you discuss them and then it spreads. So each of us has to become the living example to the best of our capacity, the embodiment of, uh, of that state of awareness uh, so that others can see that's a value. And then, of course, again, it can be contagious and boom, 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 boom. The circle widens. That's it, and I, 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 um, uh, I, I believe that I mean, you know, what is the meaning of life? And I've often said it's love, right? Love that the, the pursuit of that, that feeling. Um, I think that drives most. Period. Even even the deer in your backyard. But uh, but the other part of it is once uh, you understand that it's it's finding your bliss, you know, and whatever that is, and 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 everybody has it, you know, and then that's where you find the true enlightenment and and happiness is is when you find bliss and you get rid of that frustration and that built up anger because you didn't you didn't follow your bliss. You don't want to. You don't want to be eighty and go. Dang, I shoulda, woulda, coulda. <laughs> <laughs> no, you certainly don't. No. And and that's where individuals have to always break from the herd for a bit. You can't break completely, but for a while you need to to really find yourself, get a sense of what it is you want to do with your life and the direction you want to go in, and have the courage to overcome the inertia that is keeping you from doing that thing. And, you know, as a performer, uh, you had to break from a herd. And there were a lot of people early in your life who were thinking, you know, you should go do something else, something more secure. Do you have a backup plan? What's your backup plan? <laughs> right? But you have to move forward. And no matter what you do, you have to think it through, get a good plan, but find something that you enjoy and work towards it uh, and not allow yourself to be stuck in a kind of suicidal mediocrity. Yeah. And so many suffer from that. I mean, I feel and I understand the reasons why I was there. I get okay. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally get it. I totally and, get it. And, and we're telling you from experience, y- y- you have to pay the price of of leaving. Because if you don't, it's worse. You got to cut the umbilical cord. Yep. yep. <laughs> you yep. got to do it. Mark, fascinating conversation tonight. Now, uh, I've got your websites up, hermeticinstitute.org and, and Vocal Hermes uh, at WordPress, which uh, is a great name uh, for a website, by the way. Um, the links for everything are below. Um, where can everybody, uh, what's the easiest way to reach out to you? Well, the easiest way is uh, they can get us through Vox Hermes, and uh, that's at WordPress, but also Teachable. We have uh, quite a few classes on Teachable. 
right now the the institute's uh, celebrated its 25th uh, year in existence and we're working at consolidating all these different platforms under a single platform so that we're not we're still on the web and big presence but we're not as spread out so um, teachable is a great place because we have a free course on there called unfolding the rose and it's a fun it's a great fundamental course so we encourage uh, people to go to it and, and enroll send me send me the stuff man i'll go do it okay i'll go do it and i'll share it great. thank you so I, I look forward to our next conversation tonight we talked about everything next time you're on the show we'll put on the bumper rails okay. <laughs> wonderful i'll talk to you thank you so much mark be safe out there you too thanks bye-bye mark stavish that i told you we would be getting our knowledge on tonight. Uh, the links for everything, Mark, are below over on our website and throughout social media. I want to remind everybody, this week is a short week. We only have three shows instead of four. Uh, I am traveling uh, uh, this week, so we only have three shows this week. I will see everybody tomorrow night. And uh, I wanted to say this. Tomorrow... Uh, I've got, oh yeah, I've got Matteo Palomari tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss that. And that is tomorrow night. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thanks to Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boys, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Mateo, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.